Hello, my name is Dr. Sidney Freeman, and I'm so happy that you're here with us uh, to watch our program, Saturday Soul, and we hope that you're inspired by what we talk about today. Uh, what we want to do uh, today is have a conversation about Black higher education and historically Black colleges and universities. So right now, uh, what I would ask you to do if you're on Facebook, uh, share, start a watch party. And if you are on YouTube, subscribe to my channel and then share also. Uh, go to Sydney Freeman Jr. I'm both Sydney Freeman Jr. on uh, both uh, Facebook, uh, that platform, and also uh, YouTube. So with that, we'll get started. So the gentleman that I asked to uh, have this discussion with today is someone that I met several years ago at the time. I believe he was uh, an administrator at Virginia Union University. Uh, but at the, at the time, we met at Miles College in Alabama. And we are part of the Gamma Cohort, the Gamma Cohort uh, for the Higher Education Leadership Foundation. They were, uh, they were putting on a leadership development program, and we both were a part of that. But I've been tracking his career uh, thereafter. He also served at a, a prestigious institution that I served at, Tuskegee University, Mother Tuskegee, and uh, has gone on to become a president. So just a little bit more about his background before we bring him on. Uh, a. Zachary Faison Jr. is the first president and CEO of Edward Waters University. President Faison is a visionary and prolific higher education leader, having set an audacious vision for EWU as a destination institution of emerging eminence. President Faison took the helm of Edward Waters University, Florida's first independent institution of higher education and first historically black college or university in July 2018 as the nation's youngest HBCU president or chancellor. Since that time, President Faison has led in the development and implementation of an ambitious strategic plan and agenda for the institution titled Eminence 2025. Faison has been blissfully married for 14 years to the love of his life, Mrs. Ticey L. Faison, who is also a seasoned higher education administrator and educator and seminary trained theologian. So without further ado, we'll bring on President Faison. How you doing, Mr. Perez? Dr. Freeman, it's so good to see you, my brother. Doing well, doing very well. Great, great seeing you, great seeing you. Thanks for so much for having me on. Yeah, so when I thought about having someone on to talk about uh, HBCUs and the future of Black higher education, uh, I thought you were the perfect person. So all right, last month, we talked about uh, Black elementary K through 12 education. We had Dr. Summer Wood from uh, Nashville, Tennessee, uh, to talk about uh, pa Black parenting and also Black K through 12 education. Uh, and so now we wanted to talk about higher education and wanted to explore some of your perspective. So I want you to really kind of think about this from the perspective of, let's think we're, we're talking about the year 2050. Tell wow. us what you would imagine uh, HBCUs looking like uh, in the year 2050. Wow, wow, wow. Well, again, Dr. Freeman, let me just first say how much I appreciate you for thinking of me uh, to come on to Saturday Soul to be able to join you and, and, and all of your viewers out there and uh, in, in, in the viewing audience. Uh, so when I think about um, where I would hope or aspirantly want to see HBCUs in 2050, um, I, I think what immediately comes to mind for me um, is to see our institutions resourced uh, at the level uh, to where we really, really can collectively, collectively strive. I think um, for, for many years, um, we have often, I'll use this, this terminology or this analogy of, of, of making bricks with no straw. 
Yeah. Uh, we, we've been known, as a matter of fact, some, in, in many respects, we often champion the fact that we are able to make something out of nothing. But I think mm-hmm. we're coming to a place in our space where, 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 where that's no longer, I think, acceptable. Uh, we yeah. need to be able to make to, to continue to make something and and to make that something be something even greater. Um, but we're needing uh, the support and resources that we've long needed to be able to do that at a heightened and higher level, as you know. In mm-hmm. higher education now, the move, you know, I think universally is more around accountability and metrics and measures, graduation mm-hmm. rates, retention rates. Those things matter. Um, and, and there is no magic elixir or pixie dust that you <laughs> sprinkle uh, to make those things happen. Um, they've happened for a long time at HBCUs because uh, we had the, 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 the stick to or 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 the, or the folks that were committed to this this space, committed to our students. Um, But that, I'll tell you, Dr. Freeman, will only take you so far. Um, You can have all the greatest intentions, but you've got to marry those intentions with the resources and the the, the, the support that you need to continue uh, to to, to produce at the level that HBCUs uh, have produced and continue to produce today. And so, you know, again, I think in this ever increasing environment of accountability and competitiveness, HBCUs have to continue. And by 2050, it would be my uh, desire and my vision to see HBCUs leading uh, even more so than they are today at the forefront of being able to provide uh, not just opportunities for students of promise, but Mm -hmm. also to continue to produce high quality students of high prowess as well. Um, We've, we've, again, we have a a long history of doing that, but I think in order for us to continue to do that, uh, as we look at, you know, into the future to 2050 and beyond, that it's going to require a different level of commitment from our alumni, from our business Mm -hmm. community, from our boards of trustees, from all of us that call these uh, uh, cherished institutions home, um, that we have to invest uh, in, a, in a in a way that perhaps we've never invested before, um, and so that that's kind of what I see and what I hope that again institutions uh, HBCUs will 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 grow to even higher levels in terms of our research, our scholarship, uh, and and most importantly our impact upon student success. Because again, yeah. that's what our history is. That's who we are. Um, you know, as my grandmother always used to tell me, "Son, the proof is in the pudding." And our proof, our proof has always been in the quality of the graduates that we produce. Um, they may come to us one way, but they lead to us with their lives totally transformed. And now we push them out into the greater society to be able to make impactful marks uh, in whatever sphere of influence they choose uh, to go into. So that, that, that's, that's, I think, in a nutshell, that, that's what I see for HBCUs as we look to 2050 and even beyond. So with that, I, I, one of the first things you talked about was resources, right? Could you talk a little bit more about uh, how uh, EWU yeah. is moving forward in that regard? Because we've, you know, just watching from from LinkedIn and 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 these other spaces, I'm seeing that EWU has done a wonderful job in uh, getting getting additional resources to address your mission. So right. could you talk about how you're working toward that end? Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll be honest. And, and Dr. Freeman, you know, you and I have kindred spirits from uh, in a lot of ways politically. And so I'm just going to cut right to the chase. Uh, I think that HBCU leaders have to be much less unabashed about owning our space and, 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 and not being afraid to speak truth to power. Uh, and let me let me qualify that. Um, you know, at Edward Waters, for example, and this was this was very you know controversial, and it, it still may be to some sense. But I'll just use Edward Waters as an example. So Edward Waters, for those that don't know about Edward Waters, is not only the first HBCU in the state of Florida, we're also the first independent institution of higher learning in our entire state. So we've been here wow. since 1866. Okay, um, and so you know we have been championing this work and doing this work for a very long time. Uh, and been doing it at a high level for a long time. I mean, our, our, our list of graduates uh, uh, in terms of those that have made uh, indelible marks upon uh, not only Jacksonville, but the state of Florida and the nation and throughout the world is, 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 is renowned. 
But in many respects, uh, we've had to teach people how to treat us from an economic development perspective. Um, you know, when, when I arrived at the institution, you know, we would have all of these purported quote unquote partners. Oh, we, 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 want, we want to partner with Deadwood Waters. Hey, we want to partner. And much of it was because they, they, they had a vested interest in being associated with something black. Okay. Mm-hmm. Something black that also held the moniker of being the first HBCU in the state. Okay. And so, you know, from a, from a, from a realistic perspective, I understood why they wanted to be associated with us, but a true partnership is one that's reciprocal. So if you're going to own that political space and be able to go to uh, the folks in, uh, you know, in your boardroom or to your investors or whomever and say, Hey, you know, corporate entity a we're partnered with the first hbcu in the state of florida then 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 by proxy uh we ought as edward waters university to experience some quantifiable benefit from that partnership and that benefit does not need to be a nebulous one or a benefit that we can't concretely uh uh uh, put our hands on uh, so what does that look like? That means if we're going to have a partnership, how are you partnering with Edward Waters as an institution of higher learning to move mm-hmm. its mission and agenda of producing right. high quality graduate, uh, producing high quality students uh, that, 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 are, that, are, that are graduates of our institution? How are you impacting the living and learning spaces for my students? How are you supporting my faculty in terms of their uh, instruction and scholarship? How is this going to uh, help me? Uh, from a from a financial perspective, to ensure our long term financial posterity. So, I mean, there 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 are there are there are those boxes that when we talk about partnership, uh, that I'm looking for those to come on that really want to be true partners and make this relationship a reciprocal one, where you are now partnered with us in a very concrete and tangible way towards moving the mission of Edward Waters University forward. And so, you know, that's that's the approach that, that we have taken. It's an approach that I think more of, uh, of our HBCU leaders need to take and, and to really not be afraid to say, hey, you know what, we have prodigious needs here. Uh, I think, you know, we also have to, we have to be honest about our progeny. You know, Edward Waters and many of our HBCUs were founded, as we know, right after Reconstruction. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and in many respects, Uh, at least for uh, my institution, which is an AME, African Methodist Episcopal founded institution. I know we have other great institutions like Oakwood University, where where you you graduated (laughs) from, which is a Seventh-day Adventist institution. But but particularly for uh, the AME institutions, these were institutions that were founded by Black folk for Black folk. Uh, Mm -hmm. And so in many respects, you know, uh, the AME institutions, I think, have a uniqueness Um, in that in many respects, even up until now, they have not relinquished authority or control of their institutions, Mm. the white power structures, okay? Right. Uh, And because of that, uh, they have not had the same access to white wealth as some other institutions. Uh, (laughs) So, you know, Dr. Freeman, you had me on, so I was like, (laughs) Uh, And so we have to be honest about that conversation. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I think we have to, again, be unabashed about those realities. And then let's talk about the fact that, you know, f- since we didn't relinquish control, uh, then, then there needs to be a, a, a reinvestment or a shifting in terms of investment of financial resources to these institutions. We should not have to cede control of our institutions to be able to have access to wealth. Right. Uh, uh, you know, there, there are other uh, uh, parochial, I mean, we can look at the yeshivas or, or, or the Notre Dames or the others that are, that, are, that are religious affiliated institutions that have not ceded authority uh, in exchange for access to, to, to capital and to resources to help to buttress their, 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 their institutions. So, you know, I think, I think that's a, a hard conversation that, that, that we have to have, and, and we're having those conversations, even when it comes down to our vendors. I'll give you this as an example. I had vendors that had been long-standing vendors here that had been, quote-unquote, servicing Edward Waters for 10, 15, 20 years. And when I came in, having a background in advancement and development, I pulled, pulled, the, pulled the, the, the donor rolls, and this vendor or vendors that may have uh, generated, we may have generated 
millions of dollars in business for them over the past 10, 15 years had never made one major gift to Edward Waters. And, and so, you know, when I sit down with them, it, it, it's a different conversation. You know, you, oh, Mr. <laughs> President, you know, I'm the new president. So all the vendors come around and want to meet you. Oh, we're so happy and proud to be partners with David Waters. And I say, wait a minute. I don't think you've been much of a partner. You've been here 10 years <laughs> and generated $25 million in revenue from us, but you have mm-hmm. never been a major giver to our institution. So, I, I mean, again, I, I think it, 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 it really is. Uh, a more intentional and strategic approach to let folks know um, that we want true partners. We want folks mm-hmm. that, that that are vested in wanting to see our uh, institutions grow, that are vested in the success of our students uh, and, 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 and that really mean what they say uh, and demonstrate that in a very concrete and tangible way. And, and so when, when, when you say that, I'm, I'm also thinking about this whole discussion of reparations. We had uh, oh, yeah. William Darity uh, uh, and, and Kirsten Mellon uh, on our program wow. several months ago. I've been trying and, to get Dr. Darity. You got to get me in touch. I'm, I'm trying to bring yeah. him here for my, uh, my, my my speaker series for my students. So yeah, he's a he's 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 hard to get, but we we yeah. we're we're grateful that uh, we we were able to bring him on. But um, in saying that, there's this whole discussion about the ADOS movement, the American descendant of slaves, right. and just this push t- towards reparations. What is the role of HBCUs oh in gosh. that discussion, yeah. right? And, um, and even be- in the discussion about a- uh, about ADOS. yeah the broader the broader ADOS. We, well, let me tell you something. We should be leading that charge more than any other entity that exists right now. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. I don't care what HBC you go to. We all have uh, prodigious needs from a financial mm-hmm. perspective. Uh, and we know that it's because of, of what, what, again, our progeny, what, what we were born out of, almost each one of us. And so when we talk about reparations, I mean, you can, it's almost like you can hear a pin drop. And this is amongst black right. folks. And I'm saying, wait a minute. <laughs> I, well, why, why are we afraid of this conversation? You know, when we talk about reparations and, and we talk about opponents to reparations, like, well, how do we make that happen? Are we supposed to just cut checks to individuals? Well, maybe, may, maybe so. We can have another conversation about that. But I can tell you one direct way that you, that, that, that we can, 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 can begin to, uh, uh, have this reparative justice kind of discussion, and that's to make our HBCUs whole. Uh, right. You know, we've got we've got a bill right now uh, in in Congress that that the Biden administration is is uh, wanting uh, to get to get done. But many of of the things that were a part of that legislation, um, in terms of support for historically black colleges and universities, have been stripped. Just earlier today, uh, in, a, in a fairly unprecedented move, the United Negro College Fund, UNCF, uh, put out a signed letter by all 37 of the UNCF presidents calling for the restoration of full funding for deferred maintenance uh, yeah, uh, yeah. At, at our HBCUs, Fall, calling for the full funding of Pell Grants uh, for the students that we serve, um, calling for so many things that um, one could term that, that that perhaps this is a form of a reparation. That's due. And let me just say mm-hmm. that uh, again, I, I just believe in being unabashed. This is not something that we're asking that is as benevolence. This right. is something that we as African Americans are due. I don't mind saying that, that this is something that we are owed. Yes, owed. Mm-hmm. Anytime you go 400 years. OK, and, and, and are able to reap the benefits of what we call in the legal sense, unjust enrichment. When you go and you're able to, to, to build wealth, corporations, individuals uh, build untold amounts of wealth uh, through a capitalistic structure where you don't have to pay anything to the labor and you reap all of the benefit you owe, you yeah. owe, you owe. Uh, and so, um, you know, I absolutely believe that HBCU should, should should be at the forefront of the reparations discussion because I do think that that is one viable form of reparations that we could easily, with the minds that we have, 
uh, at the HBCU leadership table, be able to craft a narrative uh, around being able for the federal government to provide HBCUs in particular with the support, the financial support that they need, again, as we talk about 2050, to really, really launch us uh, in ways that we haven't even imagined uh, uh, before. So, so you know, I, I think we ought to be at the forefront of that discussion. So, so as you talked about policy, I know uh, I, I, there there was a brief announcement uh, recently that there's a, a center that you are, oh, yeah. are are about to launch. I think that's a perfect setup for it. So, yeah. tell us about your center. That's that well, you're I, I, yeah. So, so we were blessed to get some funding from the. Uh, Jesse Ball DuPont Fund here locally, uh, and it is going to give us the resources that we need to establish our inaugural A. Philip Randolph Institute for Race, Law, Social Justice, and Economic Policy. And, and, and shameless plug, we're looking for an executive director, the inaugural executive director for that institute. So if you know of any good folks, please have them to, to apply. But but we're looking uh, to position Edward Waters to be, as we talked a little bit about before, to really be a leader in beginning to uh, 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 develop uh, and roll out policy recommendations, not only for our state, uh, or excuse me, our local government uh, and, and, and law enforcement here uh, in, in, in Jacksonville, but also through our state and, th and, and also through, through, throughout the country. Um, where we have a place and space for policy recommendations. Because what I found, uh, to be honest with you, matter of fact, I was on the phone just yesterday with a local uh, corporate uh, 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 business entity here in Jacksonville um, that's headed by uh, a, a white gentleman. Um, and he's saying, you know, uh, I know I need to do something. I don't know what to do. You know, I know right. I need to do something in terms of diversifying my workforce. Uh, I know I need to do something in terms of our impact to the community here. Um, I want to do something to help to effectuate change in policy making in terms of, you know, what it is that how the business community interacts with minorities, minority serving businesses. How, But I don't know where to start. Where do I go? What do I do? And so I'm hearing that not just, you know, here locally, but I've heard that nationally as well. And so, you know, it, it really became incumbent upon us then, I think, and this is the role I believe HBCUs play to create a space where we are the leaders providing these kinds of solutions, providing these kinds of strategies uh, to the business community, uh, to our brothers and sisters in, in throughout our community, where they can come to us and we can give them direction, we can give them insight uh, into how they go about uh, doing these laudable things that they wanna do in terms of impacting uh, the uplift uh, of our communities on the whole, which starts with you know engaging African Americans and, and, and Black folks in a different way, and so we're excited about our, our Randolph Institute. A little known fact is that although uh, A. Philip Randolph is actually a graduate of Bethune Cookman University, um, he was uh, raised for part of his life here in Jacksonville and did his first two years of collegiate okay. study at Edward Waters College before <laughs> transferring uh, to, to, to Bethune Cookman. So we thought in the tradition of A. Philip Randolph that this new institute focusing on race, law, uh, and social and economic justice, that we would name that after A. Philip Randolph. And we're really looking forward to some great work uh, that will be emanating from that new policy institute. Wonderful. As you were saying that, I was thinking about um, President Wilson at, at Morgan State University. So yes. he's, he's really championed uh, the notion that uh, of what the debt that's owed to to HBCUs, particularly those who have a research mission, yeah, and so and we see and we see that uh, a big issue that uh, that it's not only in, in um, the case in 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 Mississippi and right. also in, in Maryland, America. right, right. But there's also a case to be made in Tennessee, as we've seen. As Tennessee, we've seen recently. Georgia. I mean, I, I mean, the, the Tennessee, a Tennessee state, Georgia, my native state. Uh, no one's found it yet, but I can assure you, I've been a graduate of two of those system institutions, one at Albany State and one, one at University of Georgia. You're talking about literally separate and unequal. I mean, when you look right. at what's, what, you know, the, the, the research capacity, the, the facilities, the, I mean, the duplication of programs that took place at HBCUs that didn't take place at the majority institutions 
which as we know is what undergirds and buttresses growth. I mean, if, if, if I have a nursing program and we start the nursing program first, but then you allow the majority institution that's 10 miles away to go build a nursing program, then you siphon off the students and you impede my ability to grow. Um, and yeah. so, to, you know, to your point, we're seeing that consistently uh, in, in almost all of these Southern states. And it, and it really aligns with our need to ask for rep reparative justice because we have been indelibly harmed by many, particularly on the state side, where you see these state policies and the underfunding of our state HBCUs. Yeah, because what, what I'm thinking about is just um, the need for institutions like yourself. Uh, you may not uh, be a, uh, you're more of a liberal arts focused institution, right, right. but you're expanding your mission uh, as a university Absolutely. now. Absolutely. And so could Absolutely. you speak to, could you speak to, uh, expanding capacity even of our smaller HBCUs. Absolutely. I, and, and, and it really goes to your point earlier about where do we see ourselves in 2050? Um, right. And I believe that for institutions like Edward Waters, um, HBCUs that have traditionally been small liberal arts uh, institutions, I think it's imperative uh, that we begin to expand the scope of who we are. Uh, does it mean that we, that we jettison who we are? But expand that. So, so, so I'm I'm a strong proponent of the liberal arts. Uh, I'm a, I was an English major, so I mean, I'm, and I'm a lawyer. Those are you know liberal art, humanity. I, those are imperative. I think that you know one of the one of the things that I'm hearing, particularly from the corporate community, is there's so much push on STEM, which is important. It's critically important. But what they're mm -hmm. saying is we're getting these graduates now that may be engineers, they may be computer scientists. And they have the skill set there, but they don't have the people and communication skills and often yeah. the critical thinking skills that come out of the humanities and the liberal arts education. And so but to, 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 towards, towards that end, we're wanting to maintain that, but at the same time also begin to expand our scope around research, around our graduate degree programs and scholarship. You know, we don't have to trade. Uh, uh, there should not be. Uh, 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 a, a, a synonymous thought that, well, because we're a teaching institution, because we're liberal arts, that we don't produce high scholarship, that we don't right. produce research. Those two things are not mutually exclusive. We can be, we can be an institution that, high, that places high value upon uh, the humanities and, and a liberal arts curriculum and, and be champions of, uh, of teaching in terms of the, the level and quality of instruction that we provide to our students, but at the same time become leaders in terms of our scholarship and research around what it looks like to teach our children, to teach right. our students, you know? And so um, we talk about culturally responsive pedagogy and, th and those kinds of mm -hmm. things. It's mm -hmm. HBCUs that should be leading in that kind of scholarship and research. And so again, at Edward Waters, that, that, that's, that's the train that we're on. We're, we're just on the precipice of, 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 of moving towards that end as this summer, we just transitioned from Edward Waters College to Edward Waters University with the promulgation of our first graduate degree program after 155 years. Which wow. is our Congratulations. Degree. Thank you. Thank you. Our yes. master's degree in business administration. And we actually, uh, it, that's just the tip of the iceberg though. We have, mm -hmm at least about two more uh, graduate degree programs that we're going to be uh, submitting the prospectus and, and curriculum for to SAC COC uh, this coming January. And what, one of them is going to be a master's degree uh, in educational policy. Uh, great, great, uh, and then great. we also have another one that's on the horizon. So we, we absolutely believe that, that if we are not just to survive, but if we want to thrive going into, again, using your 2050 as kind of a measure marking, mark, marking point, that we have to be about the business of expanding our scope from a scholarship and research perspective. Well, I want to thank you so much. What we're going to do is we're we're going to go to a quick commercial, and then we're going to have a discussion about uh, the HBCU presidency, and also learn a little bit more about Edwards Waters University. Thank you. I am the Liberation Movement. 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 My name is Dr. Sidney Freeman Jr. 
and I am the executive director and founder of the Liberation Movement, which is a 501c3 organization that works with those who are liberated and seek to be liberated psychologically, socially, and spiritually through educational initiatives. To continue to provide the high quality programming such as Saturday Soul, we need your support. Your consistent monthly investment in the movement will allow us to continue to expand on the excellent work that is already started, such as decolonizing the black mind curriculum that is already in development. So your gifts of any size uh, via Cash App, Venmo, or PayPal would be a blessing to the advancement of this ministry. Thank you in advance for supporting and joining the Liberation Movement. Please remember to join Sydney, me, and our special guest today on Clubhouse at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time so we can dive deeper into today's topic. See you soon. All right, we're back with President uh, A. Zachary Faison of Edward Waters University, and we're talking about HBCUs and Black higher education. And so now we're going to ask a little bit of, and discuss a little bit about uh, the presidency. And uh, where I want to go with this is to ask you about um, kind of your trajectory. Um, I know that you didn't necessarily come up the academic side of the house. So just kind of share share about your trajectory to becoming an HBCU president as we have a lot of uh, young people that aspire to the presidency. Yeah, well, I had a, a and as you indicated, uh, Dr. Freeman, that, that I had a non-traditional uh, trajectory. Well, and I will say this, I don't know if it's so non-traditional now. I think, I think the trajectory towards the presidency is invariably changing. Um, I think traditionally you would see, you know, someone come through the academic ranks. If it's a, you know, you're a professor and then you become a chair and then maybe a dean and on, on a associate provost, provost, and then and then become a president. And that certainly is one uh, track that that still exists. And it, it, again, it's the, the traditional track. But from my perspective, um, and it certainly is not to besmirch the, 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 the wonderful academicians that uh, have come through the presidential ranks and that still come through uh, the, the academy and, 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 and become presidents and do phenomenal jobs. But, but I think the nature of the uh, higher educational president for 2021 and beyond requires a skill set uh, that, that I think often now kind of goes beyond what traditionally the experiences may have been, not necessarily always, but may mm -hmm. have been from a person that simply comes to the academic track. So, for example, mm -hmm. uh, you have to be incredibly, incredibly adept around enrollment management uh, and growing enrollments. I mean, particularly on the private side, I think even more so or not more so, but Equally so on the state side, but even more so, I think, on the private side of the HBCU, you need some experience with managing enrollments um, because yeah. literally on the private side, you live or die uh, by enrollment management. Uh, you also have to have some high acumen around fundraising and development. And often, and I certainly don't think that, that it's not because um, academicians or academics like, like yourself don't necessarily have the skill sets, but they don't have the opportunity. Most of the time, mm -hmm. fundraising there is going to come through grant writing, uh, right. which, which is which is wonderful. I mean, it certainly is um, one 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 tool in the fundraising and development tool shed. But you often, you know, when you're uh, sitting as the president, it is more of a donor cultivation, a one-on-one. -on -one. How affable are you? How persuasive do you speak? Can you make a case? Can you can you speak to 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 and sit and hold a company with 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 prospective donors and be able to persuade them and be able to uh, uh, make sure that you have that case study and be able to articulate that articulate that in a very persuasive way? And often academics don't even get that opportunity when they're coming up through the right. Room. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that uh, my trajectory was, was one where I'm a, I'm a lawyer by trade. 
Uh, and so I actually cut my teeth in higher education on the development side. I started as an alumni affairs director uh, and then worked my way up to a director of development uh, and, and eventually a vice president in institutional advancement and development. And so I cut my teeth in higher ed in fundraising and development. Uh, and mm -hmm. there probably is no more uh, significant need that we have right now at historically <laughs> black colleges and universities than resource development. And, and, yeah, and, and as money, you know, yeah. that's one of your primary roles and jobs as a president or CEO is being able to go mm -hmm. out and develop resources for your institution. And so if that's mm -hmm. not an area in, with which you've had some prior experience and some some demonstrated success, then the likelihood of you just all of a sudden learning how to do that when you're now faced with running an organization is between slim and none. And so, you know, I think that that's, that, that was a very inviolable experience uh, that I had to have been able to come through uh, the ranks with regard to fundraising uh, and development uh, and, and, and philanthropic uh, work, uh, particularly at HBCUs and, and in higher ed. Uh, and then I had an opportunity to, to, to shift uh, and have an opportunity to do some work when I was at Virginia Union University, where we met uh, in enrollment management and student affairs. Uh, and so um, for me, that certainly was another uh, very sharp tool uh, that I was blessed to have been able to, 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 to bring on in terms of you know, the depth and breadth of my experience as a higher educational administrator. Uh, because again, as I mentioned before, uh, you know, there, there simply are going to be probably two ways in which, you know, you're going to be able to effectuate, uh, you know, financial posterity in a positive way at your institution, particularly if you're at a private and, 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 and again, at Publix as well. It's either through mm -hmm. enrollment management, enrollment growth, and then right. also uh, through fundraising and development. And as a president, uh, those are going to be primarily the, you know, the two, uh, I think, most uh, salient um, uh, 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 priorities that you're going to have. I mean, because again, it's those things that then feed, uh, if you will, the academic side of the house in terms of being able to promulgate support for the growth of academic programs, to be able to provide the resources that our faculty need to engage in the, the scholarship and research that they want to engage in. Again, as we talk about growing our academic profile, increasing our competitiveness on the academic side of the house, being able to provide the resources uh, that our academic uh, folks need to do the work that, that they're charged with doing, uh, it comes from resources generated through this enrollment management and or mm -hmm. fundraising and development. Um, and so, you know, that that was what, what, what my trajectory was. I went on from there, as you mentioned, to serve at Mother Tuskegee, the pride of the Swift <laughs> Growing South, as, I, as they like so, so officially to call it down uh, at Tuskegee and have an opportunity to, there to serve as their general counsel. Again, I'm a lawyer by trade, but also be vice president for external affairs. And so mm -hmm. uh, I was working hand in hand with the development area and also around uh, state and, and federal uh, legislative affairs and lobbying to bring resources to, to our institution. And so, you know, I, you know, I was blessed then from there to become president at Edward Waters. Um, and I think we've been able to have uh, some great success here. Uh, and I would, again, attribute it to uh, my experience as an enrollment management professional uh, this mm -hmm. past year um, at Wood Waters in the middle of a pandemic. So in 2020 and 2021, we've experienced 18 percent in overall enrollment growth. Wow. 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 I mean, as you know, I mean, <laughs> our ed, everywhere, other institutions, en enrollments are plummeting. Uh, right. In the middle of the pandemic, we've experienced over 18 uh, percent enrollment growth um, this past year as our highest enrollment in nearly 20 years. Um, we brought Congratulations. in our largest, thank you, thank you, brought in our yeah. largest class of new students uh, in the history of the institution. Um, and so we're experiencing phenomenal success. That didn't happen by happenstance. I have a great team, but mm -hmm. certainly I'd be remiss. And I think my team would say the same thing to, to, if, if, if were it not for the acumen and experience that I had had in enrollment management, uh, things might be much different. We've met and exceeded all of our uh, fundraising goals by 43% wow. uh, of, of these past two years. And, and again, this is within the backdrop of a pandemic. And so, again, I think that the nature of uh, the presidency, 
particularly at HBCUs, in terms of the skill sets and the acumen that one needs to lead the organization. Uh, and, and, and I think in many respects, although it may be uh, uh, almost sacrilege to say this, but, but HBCUs are a business. Uh, they are. <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I mean, higher education is a business. I know that that. Oh my gosh, as academicians, and we 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 just we we we, we I mean, we 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 we, we you shudder to say those kinds of things. But 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 in truth, it is. And so you're needing someone that has a high level of business acumen, also a high appreciation for the academy. They've got to be able to command the respect of their faculty, understand scholarship, support scholarship, and understand their role as president to support the scholarship, support the research, support the teaching and learning uh, that, our, that our faculty are charged um, with doing at our institutions. But at, at, at that level, you're not the provost. You're not right. the senior. Your job, in many respects, is to run this organization as a business, such that then the 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 the, the academic side of the house has the resources that it needs to do what what, what it's charged with doing. Um, because you know, I believe my job is to make sure that our faculty uh, and our staff uh, have the resources that they need to continue to provide a high quality educational experience for the students uh, that we serve. So I had a non-traditional uh, trek to the presidency, but it's one that I believe has very well prepared me um, for what the presidency looks like now in the 21st century. And and I want to, to ask you related to that, you were, uh, when you came in as president, you were the youngest president at yep. that time when you Still came am. in. I Still am. <laughs> okay. Well, 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 talk about maybe some unique challenges that a young president uh, may may face. Well, I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, I, I, I'll, 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 I'll say it like this. I think that it's one that I was already prepared for in a lot of senses because, um, you know, that old saying, you know, when you're black, you got to be twice as good or three times as good. <laughs> and I'll add on to that when you're black and then you, you're the youngest in the room. You got to be yeah. that much more competent. You got to be that much more uh, 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 able to demonstrate that that why you're in the seat. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, for the most part, uh, the challenge really has been one. Excuse me, where um, you're constantly being second guessed a lot of times, I think that. To, to some extent, folks, you know, will, will, will say, oh, well, you know, that young kid, what, what does he know? He doesn't know what he's talking about. He, has, it, you know, he hadn't done this long enough. He hadn't done that long enough. And so I, I typically uh, just kind of smile and, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a lover of trap music. Uh, and <laughs> and uh, there, there was a song a few years ago uh, by, by, by a rapper, and, 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 the, and the chorus was, Don't Believe Me, Just Watch. So I would just mm -hmm. smile. I just smile and say, "Okay, I understand you think you got it, but 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 we're going to show you uh, that 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 there's a new progressive approach and style that 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 that's going to yield some demonstrably uh, positive results." Um, and so, but I would say to young people too that are that are aspirant to not get ahead of themselves. Uh, mm. You know, I think I, I never I never had my eyes on the presidency. You know, I say that to so many. I mean, and you remember when we were in health, you know, back in in, 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 in 2015, 2016, if you had asked me then, it, someone said, well, you want to become a president? That was not on my mind. My wow. mind at that time was, was, was being the very best vice president for enrollment management that I possibly could. Um, and, and, and my experience, at least, has been um, to own the space that you're in and to make sure that you are maximizing every experience where you are, mm -hmm. that you, whether, whether you are, you know, the administrative assistant or a, 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 a coordinator, a director, an associate VP, a VP, become known to be the expert in mm -hmm. where you are. Uh, because, you know, I, I, you know, the, 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 the road is paved with folks that, have become presidents, but were never successful presidents. Yeah. And for me, it wasn't just wanting to become a president. Um, that was never the goal. Um, and then I think once other folks said to me, you were going to be a president, 
then I then said to myself, well, I don't want to just become a president. I want to be a successful president. So I think it's really is more about making sure uh, that, again, you learn all of the applicable skill sets that are going to be necessary for you to be successful once you occupy the president's seat and not being worried about when that comes, if that comes, but being focused upon being the very best and where God has planted you uh, currently. And then, you know, letting, letting, letting God use you however he may use you and plant you wherever he may plant you as you move forward, but not focusing on that. I don't believe as a goal. I think the focus should be being the very best at where you are. So with that, um, one of the things I think I know about you is that you that you ride a Peloton, right? Don't, don't yeah, you, yeah, you? yeah, I do. Yeah, and, and so so talk to talk to us about um, that. You know the work the work life balance, but just taking care of our health. Talk yeah, about yeah. That if you can. It's important, and I'll say this: it's it's something that I am, and I can be transparent enough to say that I struggle with. Um, mm -hmm. I'm a Type A personality. Um, when I go full tilt towards something, I'm full tilt on it. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. I think, breathe, eat at Whit Waters University 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. I know folks probably are like, you know, because I'm, I'm active on social media. People are like, does this guy sleep every time I look around? Is something being posted? Some, and that was out of necessity because I don't have a lot of marketing dollars, so we use these mm -hmm. free. You know, uh, 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 social media outlets to get our brand out. But, but, but to your point, I, I think it's something that I'm still navigating and learning okay. to, to really strike that right balance between uh, work and life balance. You know, I am committed to our students. I'm committed to the notion uh, of an Edward Waters University. You know, when I think about the progeny, when I think about the 29 presidents that that have come before me, when I think about you know, Reverend Charles Pierce sent down from 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 Ohio to found what later became Edward Waters College. I mean, it, it, at, 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 at the height of just coming out of slavery with 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 people that had literally nothing to have the audacity to start an institution like this. I mean, that is what inspires me. It keeps me going. It keeps me just enthused and energetic and working and working and working and working because I feel such a mantle of responsibility to make this institution collectively with, 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 with our team, uh, to make this institution the very best that it can be. But you have to strike that right balance. You know, I, 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 I can share that, you know, in my first two years at Edward Waters, I had put on about 40 to 50 pounds uh, oh, from man. working late nights, not eating, the way you're traveling, whether you're, you're flying here, you're driving there, trying to meet with donors, trying to, you know, navigate, you know, the financial realities. When I first came to Edward Waters, we were in some very, very, very severe uh, financial difficulties. So much so about 90 days in, we didn't know how we were going to meet payroll. I mean, so wow. all these things weigh on you. I mean, and, mm -hmm. you know, and so, you know, you will find yourself if you're not careful um, starting to teeter into unhealthy behaviors in terms of, for me, it was, it was eating for someone else. It may be alcohol. It may be something else. But for me, it was, it was emotional eating or, 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 or just saying, well, you know, I had a hard day today. I'm going to come home and treat myself to this pepperoni pizza or whatever it is, not mm -hmm. knowing, um, that, that, that you really are, 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 are doing yourself a disservice because, because you can't be your best self. So, you know, the pandemic, I would never call it a blessing, but there are lessons and I think opportunities um, that I was able to glean from it. And one was for the first time, I couldn't travel anywhere. We couldn't go anywhere. So we kind of had to sit in ourselves. Um, mm -hmm. And so it was an opportunity for me to reflect and I think recalibrate um, in terms of making sure that we're taking care of ourselves. Uh, and so I, I, I invested in that in, in that Peloton that you talked about. <laughs> I invested in, and I, I've been sharing this with some of my colleagues. Noom, the Noom app. The in Noom, yeah, I've yeah. invested in Noom, and and I made that invested in myself because I said if I'm not whole and healthy, and, and and vibrant, then there's no way I can be my best for my students and for Edward Waters University. Mm -hmm. And so you know we 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 started on that journey right at the start of the pandemic. 
and I've lost those 50 pounds and I maintain Congratulations. It. Yeah, I lost those yeah. 50 pounds and I've been maintaining it now for the past year as we're now in our second year with the pandemic uh, and getting on that Peloton, walking uh, and carving that out in my day. Hey, you know what? I, I know I've got these meetings. I know I've got everything else, but I have to get my four mile walk in and I've got to get on this Peloton every day. Uh, yeah. Everything else has to come secondary because again, you know, if I'm not my best, then I can't give Edward Waters my best and it deserves my best. And so I think it's absolutely imperative for our young professionals. You have to carve out that time for yourself, whatever it is that 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 keeps you healthy, keeps you whole, keep you keeps you being your best self. It's imperative that you don't relinquish that. So one of the things that uh, I know about you is that you are a uh, Although you listen to trap music, you also were a man of faith. Um, and it's my understanding that your wife is, is a theologian yes. in her own right. And, yes. and you come from a family of, of educators and those yes. who have achieved. Highly. Could you just speak to the role of family and, sure. and support and okay. what you've done? Again, you know, as, 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 you know, I, I, as, I, as I really reflect, you know, I would not be here. And of course, we all say this and it becomes cliche, but it is really the case for me uh, without the foundation that was laid by my parents. Uh, and when I say foundation, I mean foundation in faith, foundation in accountability. Uh, foundation is that, son, you're special, but you're not special, meaning that you just get when you have not earned, when you have not uh. put, put the work in. Uh, I was, I was, matter of fact, I was talking with my mom earlier today and I was, I was reflecting on a story that I told her when I was in like seventh or eighth grade. And, and, uh, another one of my classmates said, well, you know, uh, my dad gives me $50 for every A I get. So I came home to my mom and dad. I said, well, you know, Johnny, he gets $50 for every A that he makes. And, and my dad looked at me and said, I'm not giving you $50 for something you're supposed to do. You don't pay any bills <laughs> around here. You're, I expect for you to earn A's. That, that, that's the mm -hmm. rent that you pay for living in my house is that you expect to earn A's. So, uh, so that's the kind of home that I was raised in. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, our faith was absolutely a part of who I am. I was raised uh, to love Christ Jesus, that he is our source. He is everything to us. Um, and, and that was, that was a part of who, who, who we are. And now it's a part of who I am. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm unabashed about my faith, uh, about, um, who my source is, who my protector is, who my provider is. And for me, it's, it's, it's in Christ Jesus. Um, and so, um, you know, it has informed, you know, the decisions that I make, it informs who I am. I've been blessed to be partnered, uh, for now. Uh, almost 15 years with 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 my my wonderful wife, who truly I wonderful. tell folks all the time, uh, I outkicked my coverage on that one. Uh, I still have no idea to this day how I was able to convince and cajole and persuade her uh, to, <laughs> to, to marry me. But she truly um, is just a phenomenal, phenomenal Proverbs woman um, in her own right. Uh, she is a theologian. I actually met her right before she went to seminary. She's a graduate of a Christian theological seminary in Indianapolis, mm -hmm. Indiana, um, and, and, and is a great woman of God and, and certainly uh, just a phenomenal help meet to me. Uh, she's partnered with me uh, in this work that we do at Edward Waters University. Uh, and folks ask us often, do we have children? I say, yeah, I got 1,100 of them. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, you know, my wife is often, 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 you know, with our students, uh, engaged with our students. She actually serves here as our director for community service and service learning and is engaged with our community, engaged, engaging our students in our community. And so I'm so tremendously blessed to have such a dynamic partner uh, in her. And this work that we're doing, uh, to yeah. provide, you know, opportunities for support for our students. So, you know, my family, again, family of educators. My mother is a, a former K-12 a, a school superintendent. Uh, my sister is an associate professor at the University of Georgia uh, wow. in education yeah. uh, mm -hmm. and is an expert in culturally responsive pedagogy um, and really champions that. And so um, I'm blessed, tremendously blessed to have a family uh, that has always supported me, uh, that, that can put me in line when I need to be put in line, 
uh, and can pull my coattails and say, I don't care what you're the president of. Uh, <laughs> you don't, you're going to take this, you're going to take this medicine today. Uh, and so I appreciate, I so appreciate them. Uh, they are again, the proverbial wind beneath my wings. And so we're in our, our, our final five minutes. Uh, I want to make sure uh, be, before we go off air that people can get access to you, um, how they can, and, and tell us how we can support uh, support uh, Edward Waters University as it it moves as it moves forward. Uh, just share with us uh, where you see um, Edward Waters University going. In, in the near future, I know you you said a little yeah. bit of that, but just share a little bit more, and then share with us how we how we can be supportive of what you're doing there. Absolutely. Well, again, again, Dr. Freeman, I want to thank you again for allowing me to be a part of the Saturday Saturday Soul family and sharing a little bit mm -hmm. about my insights and certainly about Edward Waters University. Um, and Edward Waters University is on a rapidly moving upward and forward moving trajectory. Uh, we are, we're, we're proud to say now that we are the city of Jacksonville's fastest growing college or university. Matter of fact, I think that's someone calling me now, probably wanting an opportunity to see how they can talk about the waters. But we're, we're Jacksonville's fastest growing college or university. Uh, we're one of our state's fastest growing colleges or universities. We're the state of Florida's fastest growing historically black college or university in our entire state. No one has had the, 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 the level of growth that we've experienced the past couple of years. And so we are excited towards that end. Uh, we're going to continue to be growing. We've upgraded and have grown our athletic program at, at, at Edward Waters. We are now the state of Florida's only NCAA uh, Division II HBCU. Uh, Congratulations. Yeah, that's thank awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to be onboarding about three new graduate degree programs within the next 12 to 18 months. We have about four undergraduate degree programs in forensic science, social work, computer information science, and also a dual degree program leading to the Bachelor of Science degree in nursing that's on the horizon for the next 12 to 18 months. Um, and so we look to continue our progression as what we like to call the destination institution of emerging eminence here at Edward Waters University. So if you want more information about Edward Waters, please visit us at www.ewc.edu. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, we've just onboarded our first master's degree program, which is our master's degree in business administration. We had our first cohort. We were expecting about 25 students. So we we're expecting, expecting a pretty small cohort because we just got authorization in July and knowing that we were coming in to the opening of school in the fall. And we had so much demand that we had to cap it at about 35 students. Wow. Uh, we had to move man. to the next cohort. We had to move them to our <laughs> next cohort. Uh, because of the high demand. And so we are really, really excited about our graduate degree programs uh, and just excited about all that God is doing here at Edward Waters University. And we want folks to be a part of what we're doing. Uh, incidentally, I also mentioned we just opened our brand new on-campus stadium. It's a multi-million dollar beautiful facility. Yeah. Uh, our new our football program, our new women's soccer program uh, that we've just brought on. We're going to be bringing back women's golf for the first time. Uh, uh, next semester. And so there's it, so much going on. Our new academic programs, we talked about our social justice center, our A. Philip Randolph Social Justice uh, Institute that we're going to be uh, launching uh, in the coming year. So just so much excitement at Edward Waters University right now. And so if you want to follow me personally, you can follow me on Instagram at Millennial Prez One. Millennial Prez One is, is, is my moniker there. Follow me on uh, Twitter. Uh, at Millennial Prez uh, on Twitter. Uh, you certainly can email me, azfazon at ewc.edu. Uh, I always like to uh, 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 be able to return our emails within 24 hours. So please reach out to us, visit us, www.ewc.edu. We'd be excited, excited to have you partner with us. Now question, does the institution have a cash app? Yes, yes, yes. If you go on www.ewc.edu, look in the upper right hand corner, you will see donate now. There's okay. cash app there. You can make it. Hey, listen, we'll take check, money order, however you want to get it. The apparatus is there for you to be able to give to Edward Waters University. So you visit www.ewc.edu. Look in that upper right hand corner. You will see a button that says donate now or give here now. And we certainly want to see you invest in the state of Florida's first independent institution of higher education and first historically black college 
or university at the Edward Waters University. Thank you so much, Dr. Freeman. No problem. And I want to thank our audience for, for being with us today. I hope that uh, this has illuminated your mind regarding uh, HBCUs and the future of Black higher education. We want to thank President Faison for his time. And we'll look for us uh, later today uh, when we will be on Clubhouse to have more conversation regarding this important topic. Have a wonderful rest of the afternoon. God bless you.